Yeah, you can look wherever you want. <laughs> All right, so I'm sitting here at the, um, the 2009 Expedition Medicine National Congress with one of my favorite people in the whole world, Dr. Jerry Mendelson from Oregon. And Jerry uh, was a medical student a year ahead of me at the University of Arkansas and went on to become a, a dermatologist. But she has a very interesting career background because she's not the, the, uh, the typical physician. Um, she was a wildlife biologist, and she's done research on a number of really interesting things. So. We just wanted to talk to her about her career and how she got into wilderness medicine and expedition medicine and what she's doing now. So, Jerry, to begin with, tell us who you are and where, you, where you're working right now and what you're doing. <laughs> what I'm doing. And then talk about how you got into this. How, okay. how did you get into wilderness medicine? Well, I, I'm a dermatologist, practicing dermatologist in Southern Oregon. And um, as a kid, loved bugs, collected bugs, snakes. My whole room was filled with critters. And so I always knew I wanted to do science. Mm -hmm. And I really didn't have a good mentor. I always think about that because I do a lot of schoolwork mm -hmm. still. You know, I, do, I visit the high schools and I have several talks. And mm -hmm. uh, I always think mentoring in science is real important because I think a lot of people don't, don't teach yeah, science that's really true. well. So kind of, you know, started off as a kid loving science. My mom was a mm -hmm. musician. My dad an engineer. They could give a flip about my, <laughs> my animals. <laughs> and so I was trying to find my own. All I know is that they terrorized my older brother, and that was, you know, that, that was works. worth it. That's right. Yeah, That's right. so I had the upper hand there, you know, especially when the snakes got loose. But, you know, went uh, through high school. My, my grandparents ranched, and so I spent every mm -hmm. summer rounding up cattle, fishing, and, and my dad loved to fish. So we were real outdoors people, mm -hmm. even though we were in the suburbs of Chicago. We were, mm -hmm. I was just a real science nut. And so I had determined at an early age I was going to be a wildlife biologist. By gosh, there's an old TV show that's called Doctari. And I decided I was going to be like those guys and discover new species around the world. That's fantastic. And that was, yeah. And so I went to University of Wyoming. There's two really good field schools for wildlife. Mm -hmm. Actually, there's probably more than that. But Fort Collins was one in Colorado and Wyoming. And basically, the last two years, you do almost all field work. And I was wow. just, I loved it. I, I admit I had a great time in college. So it wasn't just yeah. all studies. But... It was a great place to do wildlife biology. And it, wow. was, it was more of a big game place. I had mm -hmm. some good, good bird stuff, but I, I was more, more drawn to the management of big game. And, mm. um, and then, you know, graduate, very few jobs. As yeah. a wildlife biologist, yeah. you can either yeah. do state or feds, and it, these are lifetime jobs. Right. Nobody gives these jobs up, so you're basically competing. You know, it's like, like it is now. It's tough. Right. Right. And uh, at least now there's more private agencies like, you know, the, the Wilderness Federation right. and some of these right. guys. And so I decided, by gosh, I think I'll go to Peace Corps mm -hmm. and I'll see what I can do. Well, they looked at my application at Peace Corps and they rejected me. They said, sorry, you're a wildlife biologist. We, mm -hmm. we like to recruit English teachers and stuff like this. But the Smithsonian has got an environmental program mm -hmm. that might suit you just great. And this was a short-term you know, I don't even think they have it anymore. Yeah. But they plugged me and seven other biologists into Thailand. And we basically were under the auspices of Peace Corps, you know, mm -hmm. training-wise. But once we, we got in country, we were all put on different reserves. And we all had different, mm -hmm. you know, things. I was studying the Gar, the Kukre, and the Bantang up in northeastern mm -hmm. Thailand. And lived in a village, you know, had my little family. Call me there. Right. I was there for about two years uh, working with the Royal Thai Forestry Service. And then I stayed on for a little bit longer to teach at the Northeastern uh, cool. um, University in Konkin. You know, I learned a great language, saw a different culture. Mm -hmm. um, I have kids now, and um, when the kids get up, they always go, I'm taking you to a developing country where there's, <laughs> there's no running water and there's no electricity. I'm going to see how the heck you do. Yeah, that's right. Because it was probably one of the most humbling experiences to see how people had so little but were so yep. happy. Absolutely. So I came back with an anthropological interest as well, but... I, I still knew I wanted to do animals, and I really thought I was set to do vet medicine. I really, mm -hmm. I thought, you know what, how can I, how can I do something? You know, the other thought in my mind is on weekends I worked in this leprosy clinic. The Good mm -hmm. Sisters of Scotland had this great mm -hmm. leprosy clinic in Thailand, and I would drop in. And, you know, basically it was lepromatous, so people had things falling off, and you did a lot of secondary, you know, you did a lot of dressings, and it was secondary infections that would kill these people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was very... Um, that was a great experience, and I, when I got home, um, I knew I wanted to work with people. I thought medicine would be really cool, but I thought, well, yeah, I've got all that, all that uh, uh, work behind me in wildlife. Maybe I should mm -hmm. just go into vet medicine. So, um, but I wasn't sure yet, and I put out some applications, 
and I got a staff biologist job with the Ochico National Forest in Eastern Oregon. I got a couple others through the Forest Service and the Wildlife Service, but I thought, I think I'll go to Oregon and I'll still give you know field work a chance. Right. And I realized when I got up there, this is in Burns, Oregon, population, you know, 2,000. And I loved it. I'm a pretty gregarious person, though. You know, Thailand was great, and it was a very small village. But when I got back to the States, I thought, you know what? I think I'm just too people-oriented to be stuck out doing right. what I was doing. I mean, I had everything anybody could want. I had a half-ton rig. <laughs> I had, you know, a beautiful district right, to, right. you know, to go and look at wildlife and did a lot of raptor studies, did some goshawk wow. studies, you know, did a lot of big game management, and I absolutely loved it. But I realized at that point in my life that I love basic science, too. Mm -hmm. Ecology, management, wildlife management is, is more of a kind of an art. I mean, it, we don't have a lot of hardcore stuff like you have. And science is not hardcore. You can even disprove some theorems, I've decided. Right. So, But this one, this is really soft science. And right. so I thought, you know, I really liked physics. I like chemistry. Mm -hmm. I think I need to get back, and I think maybe I'll do vet medicine. So... Um, I got, I was looking for a teaching fellowship because I, you know, I had no money, you know, and the parents were great. They put me through college, you know, right. but I wasn't going to ask them for a dime. No, uh, no right, way. Right, 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 right. <laughs> you know, I was an independent woman that did <laughs> half time rig. You know, I'm not going to go asking my folks for bucks. And so I got a teaching fellowship at University of Oregon working on bats. And I found it. That's where you got your master's. That's where I got my master's. And I needed, um, you know, the bats uh, have always fascinated me. You know, they have penetrated a niche that is un, unpenetrated by any other, you know, mm -hmm. uh, animal. And uh, they were fascinating to me, and so I thought this would be a good deal. But also, I was getting my coursework paid for, so mm -hmm. I had to do organic chem. And my wildlife uh, courses took me only so far, and then I had to do a lot of prereqs to get to vet school mm -hmm. if I wanted to do vet, because I was still thinking about medicine. So I got caught up in this bat lab, you know, bat lab, and I always have to go da-da-da-da-da-da. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they were... They were great people, but a little strange. Going to bat meetings was... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, I, I can uh, imagine. We did. We had a colony of uh, Aptesicus fuscus, and actually one of the docs, Dr. Worrell, showed yeah. you know, they are major rabies carriers in some parts of the world. But we had we did studies on Aptesicus and also the Philostomids, which are the leaf-nosed bats mm. from Central and South America, and basically looking at their different signaling. And mm. uh, fascinating, a lot of physics... Um, um, a lot of hunting behavior. We also had Zippo, an Australian fruit bat that I took around to the schools. <laughs> oh, that's cool. They're really so big, right? The big they're ones. huge, a huge yeah. wingspan. Have a, have a head like a cat. Uh, very uh, visual. So they have rods and cones. So, you wow. know, a lot of times people think of bats as just totally blind, but these guys, they had a broadband click, a real primitive echolocation. They didn't use that much. They used more sight and smell. Interesting. And so I learned a lot about bats. Um, but I realized right then and there that was going to be research. And again, instead of yeah. being stuck out in the field, which I still love. I mean, gosh, I'd love to go out in the field sometimes in my clinic days. I just right. hang on the windows and, <laughs> and whine. But here I'd be stuck in a lab. And I just thought, man, I yeah. don't think I can do research. Although I really got sucked into it. I love taking right. one little piece of information and just knowing, being the expert. Yeah. You know? And I think that's... You know, I think in science we always do that. You always pick apart things and really get get all everything you can. And that's what I did with bats, and I loved it, but I just didn't think I'd do anything. Well, I met this great guy. Bruce. Yes. I knew we were going to get to him eventually. And uh, <laughs> he was my genetics um, TA, and um, uh, I just we just fell in love. He was uh, getting his doctorate in neurophys. And uh, he waited till after he got his doctorate. I kept going, you know, so you're going to marry me or what? He was going, <laughs> well, I was going to wait till after, you know, I got my doctorate, but okay, all right. And so we got married and immediately went to Northwestern. So he was doing a mm -hmm. postdoc, and uh, I got pregnant at that point. I got into vet school. So almost the same month that I, I got into vet school at Penn, mm -hmm. I got into Penn and also to, to Fort Collins. Mm -hmm. And um, I just looked at him and I said, you know what? I don't think I want to have kids and be in professional school. I That'd just can't do it because I want to raise the, I want to raise kids. So I decided, well, why don't I crank out a, a couple of them? <laughs> so, <laughs> so we were at Northwestern, then we went to University of Pitt, and in that time I had two kids. We did. And um, because I had a master's, I could teach. Yeah. So they were always looking for anatomy and phys lab teachers. Uh, I think I did some basic biology courses. 
And so, you know, I kept up on my science. I kept my foot in the door. Right. I only worked a couple afternoons a week so I could raise the boys. And so we got to Arkansas where uh, Bruce had a lab. He was a neurophysiologist, was studying fetal alcohol syndrome. And I announced to him, you know, honey, I think I'm going to go to med school. And he goes, get out of here. That's great. I said, you know what? I just love, I've decided I just love this stuff so much, and it would give me my people outlet, and I could work That's with right. people. And anatomy and phys really teaching that, I think, really solidified what I wanted to do. That's and great. so um, we got to Arkansas. I got in, I waited till the boys got in school, mm -hmm. and then I started uh, med school. How old were your kids and when you started? They were like five and seven. Wow. You know, so they were both in school. In Arkansas, they have that full time kindergarten. Right. So that helped me a little bit. But you know those two, I hate to even tell you this, but those first two years I was hardly in class because I would just take home the take home tests. I'm, I'm for those of you who can't see me on the video, I'm turning green with envy because <laughs> what you don't realize, she's being very modest, is that Jerry was at the top of her class at the University of Arkansas and I was a year behind. I, I'm not going to say what my grade point was, but it was lower than Jerry's. Oh, man. <laughs> well, it was, I think it was just because I was older, I was more directed. I saw my classmates you know, trying to get dates and going to the bars, yeah. and by God, I'd get home, make yeah. dinner, put the boys to, get to bed, and then at 9 o'clock, and Bruce and I would trade off reading or bathing. Are you going to read tonight or are you going to bathe? Mm -hmm. And so we were so regimented, and then I would study till midnight, get up at 4. I mean, wow. I don't know how I existed on so little sleep, but I tell you what drove me is that I loved the material. That's great. So those That's first great. two years, I absolutely adore science, mm -hmm. and I think that it all started to come together. It was almost like an epiphany when you see all these things coming together. Yeah. Here I'd worked in the field and now I was doing the, the really hard, you know, I wasn't hardcore when I was undergraduate. I was, I was kind of flake and I was having a great mm -hmm. time. And I was doing more field work stuff. Right, right. But this stuff really solidified, I think, my interests and brought everything together. And it just, you know, brings up all these cool questions. And uh, when I went to, to med school thinking of family practice because I was thinking mm -hmm. about my village and just doing general mm -hmm. medicine and what would get me back overseas. Mm -hmm. But I had this family, and mm -hmm. uh, I, I needed to be true to the boys. Yeah. And so I, um, I had one guy come up to me and says, why don't you do Durham? Mm -hmm. I said, oh, aren't they like estheticians? <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> yeah. Durham, I, you know, because I'd always thought about family practice. And so I think it was my junior year, my senior year, I remember being up all night with the neurology. I was doing rotation of that third year. You do your internship, and I was up all night. I went into the, to the Durham chair, you know, Tom Horn. Mm -hmm. And I go, sir, what is it going to take for me to get into your program? Because they accepted two people a year. And, and usually we had 850 applicants the year when you're wow. a resident. You basically have to, when you're the, I was one of the head residents and I had to go through all the applications and we had to send. And he goes, I'll tell you what, do me a research project mm -hmm. and uh, publish and I'll consider you. And so this was my beginning of my, no, very end of my junior year. And I was just going to start my rotation senior oh my year. Gosh. And so I quick rearranged my schedule and got like four months of like derm path and research. And so I did a study on the erector piling muscle. Oh my God. <laughs> Do you know how important this is? And I did it on the integrins that anchor it into the dermis. And the wow. erector piling muscle is the muscle, you know, that constricts. Yeah, yeah. You get goosebumps, right? And Tom's uh, question was, how is it anchored in the dermis? It's sitting there. It's anchored to the hair follicle, to the bulb. But we don't know how it's anchored up here. And it looks like it's going to the epidermis, but it isn't. Interesting. And so what I did is I had to visit the morgue every day. And I took scalp, occipital scalp sections from dead people. Wow. And then I went ahead and processed all this tissue looking for integrins. And integrins are adhesion molecules. And they come in alpha and beta. And so I, I can't tell you how much money I spent on antibodies. And he just goes, you just order whatever you want. Man, I was like a kid in a candy store. And so I finally figured out what integrins are involved in anchoring this muscle and what... That's amazing. It was fascinating. So I got yeah. a couple papers. <laughs> That's great, though. And, uh, but, man, I work like a dog because I realized, number one, I had to stay in Arkansas because yep. of Bruce's um, commitment to his lab and because uh, the boys were still in school. Yep. And so I worked my tail off. But you got and, in. Uh, but I got in. And That's so um, I did derm, loved derm, and, and I think... The theme that really came back to me in Durham was infectious stuff. I absolutely yeah. adore infectious disease. And I realized to this day, too, I could not have done that. I couldn't have done internal medicine infectious because it was so hospital-based, so demanding, yeah. and I couldn't raise my boys. Yeah. And so now uh, I've been in clinical practice you know, for several years. Love it. 
but you know, my first love is probably still the outdoors and critters. And to me, the best tie-in is a lot of the infectious stuff that I see. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I've, I've used some of that, I think, you know, in the wilderness medicine stuff because I do some of the overlap. We see tons of rashes and, and dermatologic right. manifestations of some of these things that we see out in. So that's probably my, that's my love. Um, general derm is still just a hoot. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that is so wonderful about derm is that we're trained as derm pathologists too. So we look, we can, right. we can legally look at our own slides. I can't look at other people's slides. But in my office, I can biopsy one day and I get the slide the next day. So cool. as far as your visual acumen and your you know clinical skills, it really helps a lot. But the mm -hmm. pathology is, a, uh, is another facet of derm that is one, it's like, a different world under the scope and wow. I, you know every morning I start reading slides around five with my big mug of coffee you know with a cat laying the, the, the lab tech keeps going what's all this hair on your slides because I have this cat that just kind of lays <laughs> and so I do that and I go to the office and I have incredibly wonderful patients you know and with derm you do have a lot of chronic patients yep. chronic problems that you follow these guys and you end up see, it's like a pediatrician you start seeing the whole family yeah. Yeah. and um it, it's a wonderful specialty. Um, sometimes I feel a little clinic locked, and I yeah. think that's why I do a lot of these things that I'm doing. You and know, you've gone therapy. recently. I know you've done a lot of trips uh, recently. Right. Uh, and where where have you gone? And I know you talk a little bit about that. Well, we went to Mount. We climbed Kelly Mount mm -hmm. Kilimanjaro with the wilderness group, and uh, I did talks along the way. And my husband, now he has talked about you know. Cha life changes, he is now a physical therapist. So mm -hmm. he basically did gross anatomy for us mm -hmm. when we were in med school, but he also taught at the PT school. And they said, hey, you want to get a degree in PT? And he did. So he does mostly PT. So he did a lot of the talks on, you know, fractures and, yeah. and splinting and taping and stuff. And uh, and then I did a lot of the other talks. But we went to Kili, did safari. And, of course, I am the super geek <laughs> in the <laughs> little car because I know every ungulate out there. I have all my ID books there. That's great. And I could tell you, you know, the, the social structure of each, you know, antelope. That's great. And That's everybody great. was just like, oh, my God, how do you know this? And I go, well, I was a big game biologist. This was like my dream to come to the Serengeti yeah. Plains. I mean, it was just, I mean, I was just awestruck. And we yeah. went to the Nagorgon Crater. But, again, you combine that with medicine. I, I can't think of two better combos. And then mm -hmm. you throw people in the mix. Yeah. And it's just probably the most fun thing I've, I've ever done in my life. And, and we went to Machu Picchu, too, which, yep. again, another culture, another set of, uh, you know, of uh, diseases. And just, just wonderful. It's fascinating. Yeah. Well, okay, so if someone's watching this interview and they're either, you know, student level, med student, resident, or they're out in clinical practice and, and something and they want to – have some sort of change in their career and they're thinking wilderness medicine, expedition medicine, you know, they want to, they want to change things up and they want to do things a little bit differently. What would be your advice to getting into doing something like what you've done? I mean, as far as getting into wilderness medicine or yeah. international work or research right. or, I mean, what advice would you have to these folks? That's tough. Mm -hmm. You know, I always tell people, you know, the end of my career here, and not the end, gosh, I hope I'm just starting. I'm kind of old, but I'm not that old. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm thinking, for me, it was serendipitous wanderings. And, right. you know, basically my heart led me, wonderful supportive husband, mm -hmm. You know, kids that were great, and I think a lot of it was led by my interests and right. support by my family, and I right. think that's probably the biggest thing. But I think you need to be bold. Sometimes you just need to kind of go outside the, the box and just take some chances. Yeah, absolutely. And you have to worry. You know, you have to think about your lifestyle. You know, you can make a lot of money in some things that never guided me. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that. Um, that's a good thing to do is let your heart lead the way. You can't yeah. starve, right. but you really, um, you know, look at your interests and kind of Absolutely. hone them down. But, you know, there's a lot of, con I know you do a conference about how to, you know, kind of segue into mm -hmm. more wilderness medical stuff. Yeah. The, the medical fusion, I think, is great because mm -hmm. that would actually tell somebody how to do it. Right. You know, for me, again, I think it was just luck of the draw that yeah. really did it for me. But I think you are going to outline ways to do it. And yeah. that's, uh, I think you just have to get involved with stuff like you're doing. And just, um, you know, I'm more of a teaching, you know, I've had teaching under my belt, which I kind of drew on from my graduate school days. Right. And so that helped me get into speaking. Right. Right. And um, I'm certainly not the, the primo medical liaison on these trips. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody had, we were up in... Um, 
in Kille, and we were at the breakfast wall. It was right. part of our, our trek. And this gal had dyspnea at rest. And um, I said, guys, I think she has hate. Does anybody have some, you know, a stethoscope? And I'm sitting there going, how do you put this in? And I, <laughs> I go, you guys, I go, somebody's going to have to help me. And, of course, I'm surrounded by ER docs. Right, right. So I, dra- I grab one. I go, come here, help me listen to this person, you know. Yeah. So, you know. There is, if you're general medicine, you know, it would be great to be a medical liaison on some yeah. of these trips. Yeah. And I think that uh, that is really would be a great thing to do. Yeah. And I'd like Absolutely. to learn, no, I'd like to know more just so I could, I always feel, I want you to know I do go to the person when they say, is there a doctor, you know, in the store. Good for you, Jerry. I, do, I run to them and I go, <laughs> I'm just a dermatologist, but I'll try to help you. <laughs> so, ABCs and, and yeah, by the way, your skin exactly. looks great. Exactly, and you look great, ma'am. <laughs> Well, great. Well, listen, we won't take any more time, but um, but thanks for telling yeah. us a little bit about your background. Yeah. What I love is that, you know, all the people I've met who are in the wilderness medicine or expedition medicine, they always are very interesting people, and they've gotten into it for a variety of reasons. But, but almost universally, they say things like, I've chosen to live below my means because I wanted to follow my heart, and I knew that there, you know, I wasn't trying to get big bucks out of this. I just wanted, I had a passion for this area. And that's how I ended up in it. And that's always really inspiring. Right. So, I think that's the truth. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, well, uh, thanks, thanks for the interview yeah, and, and thanks. thanks for speaking at the, at the event. Yeah. All right. Yeah, thank you.